Hello and welcome to this week's Reflection from Morpeth Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us again. I'd like to thank those who'll be helping me with this morning's worship. So I'll be aided this morning by Claire, by Gillian and by Stephen who'll be helping share in our prayers and in some of our readings. So we're going to continue in prayer. Jesus the Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. His birth in Bethlehem did not change him, but we could see him in human likeness. His death on Calvary did not change him, but we saw for ourselves his total obedience to the Father. His rising from death did not change him, but we saw the power of God in action. His ascending did not change him, but revealed the eternal Lord, who is all in all. Amen. And so we come to our first hymn this morning, which is All Heaven Declares. All heaven declares The glory of the risen Lord Who can compare With the beauty of the Lord Forever He will be The Lamb upon the throne I gladly bow the knee And worship Him Thank you, living God, for the sure foundation of our faith. Built not on rules, but on life. Your life in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that your offer of love is unconditional, not governed by chance, but by the deep and broad grace you've shown the world in Jesus. We thank you that your call is not only to a few, but to all. A call to repent, a call to believe. We thank you that choice and not chance govern our discipleship. The choice to say yes and become followers of the way. We thank you that your offer is for life fulfilled through service and self-giving, losing our lives to find them. We thank you that your kingdom is not built on fickle and temporary whims, but the firm foundation principles of justice and righteousness. We thank you that our life with you is not a lottery, but a firm offer. Living God, we choose the life you offer and ask for strength to live by your invitation. God of mercy, 
forgive our sin. You free us to be followers of Jesus, but too often we chain ourselves to other ways and forget our calling. Too often we destroy the peace you give by unthinking and uncaring acts. Too often we spurn the love you show and deny love to others. Too often we fall silent before injustice and compromise ideals. Too often we want to be Lord of all our days and reject the sacrifice of will and life. Forgive us, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is a reading from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. John 15, 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. The title of our reflection this morning could be summed up in six words. Greater love. Love in four dimensions. When someone mentions different dimensions, we tend to think of things like parallel universes. Alternate realities that exist parallel to our own but where things work or happen differently. However, the reality of dimensions and how they play a role in the ordering of our universe is really quite different from the popular characterization. To break it down, dimensions are simply the different facets of what we perceive to be reality. We're immediately aware of the three dimensions that surround us on a daily basis. Those that define the length, width and depth of all objects in our universe, the X, Y and Z axes respectively. And beyond these three visible dimensions, scientists believe that there may be many more. Science suggests that the fourth dimension is that of time. In fact, the theoretical framework of superstring theory posits that the universe exists in 10 different dimensions. These different aspects are what govern the universe, the fundamental forces of nature, and all the element elementary particles contained within it. And there ends my extremely superficial knowledge of superstring theory. Please don't ask any follow-up questions. Thank you very much. Today we're thinking about some of those words from John's Gospel read to us by Gillian and the four dimensions which that passage mentions. In this case, however, it isn't a scientific matter which is under consideration, but rather something much more central to the Christian faith. 
that of love. It's a word which is mentioned nine times in those nine verses, so the author obviously felt it was of major importance to his readers. In John 15, 9-17, Jesus talks about four kinds of love. The Father's love for Christ, Christ's love for us, the disciples' love for Christ, and the disciples' love for each other. He tells us of love in four dimensions. Firstly, the Father's love for Christ. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And this statement in itself is absolutely colossal. It's almost beyond belief. We know that the love between God the Father and his only Son is both eternal and infinite in its depth. Yet Jesus tells us that his love for us is identical to the love the Father has for him. There can never have been a time that Jesus didn't love us intensely. If it seems certain that the Father loves the Son, then we can accept the same certainty that Jesus loves us in exactly the same manner. The Lord's statement is meant to give us confidence that we are loved. Secondly, Christ's love for us. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Christ proved his love for us by laying down his individual life for us and dying in our place. Greater proof can no one show than this, to lay down their life for their friend. He gave his all though he knew our individual bankruptcy and foresaw the terrible cost to himself. Thirdly, the disciples' love for Christ. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Jesus says, do what I ask of you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And elsewhere in the letter to the Galatians, we're told that what this fruit is. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. But that perhaps is for another reflection on another day. And then finally, the fourth dimension, the disciples' love for each other. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. This is my command, love each other. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Four Loves, describes firstly affection, secondly being in love, thirdly friendship, and fourthly the love which he calls charity. And I think we tend to associate charity with charitable giving or receiving. And it's perhaps even taken on a slightly negative connotation in that people don't want to be on the receiving end of charity. But that's not what C.S. Lewis is talking about. The love Lewis describes is what the biblical writers call agape. And what kind of love is this? Well, this is the same type of love that we talk about when we say God is love. The love Jesus is talking about is the kind that gives of itself completely and utterly. It's the kind of love that gives up all the power in the universe to become a puny, relatively powerless human being. When Jesus is telling us to love one another, he isn't talking about having affection for one another, though we may have that. He isn't talking about being in love with one another, though we may joyfully find ourselves in that condition. He isn't even talking about having true and deep friendships with one another, though we again may be lucky enough to have those. Instead, he's talking about a love that transcends all the other loves, because it's ready to give of itself totally wildly and extravagantly, without hope or expectation of receiving anything at all in return. It's ready to give, even at the risk of its own life, its own welfare. That is agape love. That is God love. And that's what we're called to as followers of Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. God wants us to have relationships that are more than mediocre. Relationship building takes time and requires compassion and wisdom and empathy, kindness, courtesy and forgiveness. And we can't overlook what taking that concrete action can mean. We can be active in love for one another. It's a lot of work. 
But that's fine because God knows that we can do this work and he knows that what we do will enrich both our lives and the lives of those whom we serve. When we love one another, we act as God's hand and feet to those that he puts in our lives. It does take time and effort and money to be an active friend, but the blessings outweigh the costs. So John is reminding us that Jesus came to change life. Jesus came and through his death showed us how much God truly loves us. Jesus came and chose us. People who are imperfect, people who are broken, people who are very much human to tell this world the good news. Jesus came and invited us to abide in God just as God abides in us. John is reminding us that we are called to live in this world, this broken, hurting world, and to love, to love kindness, to make justice and walk, to walk humbly with our God. That all our actions, all our words must be rooted in one commandment, to love one another as Jesus loves us. That it doesn't matter whether we like one another or not, but that we are responsible for and to each other because we're very much connected through God's love. And for John, his community and our community, that is what makes the difference. God's love. That Jesus commands us to love as God loves. Jesus knew if he'd written that we're called to love others as we love ourselves, that it'd be a real problem. Because we have to admit there are times we don't like ourselves, let alone love ourselves. If we love as Jesus loves us, we'll see all through God's eyes. We would see past the faults, see past the differences, see past the things that separate us and just see the person as God created them to be. We'd see the image of God in everyone and know that all are welcome and loved by God. We'd realise that whether or not we like this person doesn't matter. We're connected to this person and responsible for and to this person. Then once we realise this, once we start to do this, to love as God loves us, we could live out the vision of God's kingdom here on earth as a community of faith and to be channels for the divine love that is God's gift to the whole world in Christ. We're called to love as Jesus loves us and we know that this love is life-changing. This love is trans transforming. It's patient, it's kind, it's not envious or rude. This love doesn't insist on its own way. And we know that it binds us together as brothers and sisters in faith. There's no divide between the church world and the real world. There's only one world. And this world will know us by our love for one another. Because it's love for one another, not as we love ourselves, but as God loves us, that will be the most convincing witness to the truth and power of the gospel that we're called to proclaim. We have the ultimate example. Jesus' actions provide the pattern by which we are to act towards one another. We are known and held and loved by God, but we're also commanded to belong to one another. We're called to show this world that they will know we are Christians by our love. We're called to show God's love through our actions and our deeds in everything that we do. But we're often acutely aware of a wide chasm which can separate our words and our actions. And we know that people's lives often speak louder and clearer than their words. And maybe it was that same knowledge that led Francis of Assisi to frequently remind his monks wherever you go preach and use words if necessary. Amen. Good morning. In our prayer this morning after you hear the words Lord send us your Holy Spirit you may wish to say out loud that our lives may glorify you. Let us pray. Going to the Father. Lord, why is it that this world of yours is at the mercy of our human limitations, 
or blind decision-making or voracious greed, we find it hard to understand, but we pray for those who are the victims of flawed government, the victims of their rulers, limited wisdom, limited goodness, limited justice, limited compassion, victims of their own powerlessness. We pray that your spirit may blow in the world, stirring up the hearts of leaders and people, that they may be prepared to work and to suffer to create peaceful and just societies. Lord, send us your Holy Spirit, that our lives may glorify you. Lord, why is it that your family of humankind have limited their sensitivity and love by hardening their hearts against one another? We find it hard to understand, but we pray for those who are the victims of our limited love. The victims of famine, intolerance, warfare, poverty, victims of their needs for others. We pray that your spirit may inspire the world, warming up cold hearts so that leaders and people may be prepared to sacrifice what they do not really need in order to give others life. Lord, send us your Holy Spirit that our lives may glorify you. Lord, why do the people of your church, those who should know and love you best, often appear lukewarm to others and to you? We find it hard to understand, but we pray for those who are the victims of our reserve, the young and the searching, the stranger in our pew, those who do not fit in our own fellowship, victims of a timid timidity about entering real life. We pray that your spirit may breathe fresh courage and assurance into the church so that leaders and people may bring the love of God into the lives of many. Lord, send us your Holy Spirit that our lives may glorify you. Lord, why is it the lives of so many are limited by illness or handicaps, by faults of character, by early death? We find it hard to understand, but we pray for those who are the victims of such limitations, those with frustrated lives, the sick, the dying, those handicapped by physical, mental or emotional limitations, the embittered, the guilty and regretful, and for all those who love and care for them. We pray for those who have lost people they love, and for those who are ill or housebound. We pray, Lord, that your spirit may come and bring a new sense of freedom into their lives, the freedom that comes from knowing we are loved and accepted by you. Lord, send us your Holy Spirit, that our lives may glorify you. In the name of him who returned to the Father in order that his human limitations might be changed into the freedom of the Holy Spirit, our risen Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we sit joined together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so we come to our closing hymn this morning, which is one of Wesley's great hymns, And Can It Be?
So as we come to the end of our time together today, a blessing. Lord Jesus Christ, we have heard your call to walk the Christian way and have received your ministry of healing and reconciliation. Now send us on our pilgrim way. Give us strength to keep the faith, insight to know where you are leading and love for all our travelling companions. And so we join together in saying the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>